Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. No matter what your business, companies need to find ways to reach their customers. It's just fundamental. If you want to sell something, you have to find a buyer. The commercial space industry is no different. And my guest on this edition of the Xterra podcast is Michael Daly, co-founder and CEO of Communications Metrics, a PR and communications firm focused in part on helping space companies find that audience. Michael, welcome to the program. Hi, Tom. Thank you for having me today. My pleasure. Great to talk to you. Talk to us, first of all, about the nature of the business of Communications Metrics. Well, Communication Metrics is a public relations agency. Uh, we specialize in integrating marketing and public relations and strategic communications with a special focus on the space industry, and that is new space. So we call it so we call it civic, civil, um, uh, government, and commercial space. And we have customers in all of those realms. As it says in our title, too, our focus is on metrics. So we always plan our campaigns, execute our campaigns with the uh, metrics in mind for whatever leadership we're servicing at that time. Talk about your background a little bit and tell us how you kind of got involved in the aerospace sector. I have about uh, 27 years in the communications business. Um, I started kind of early with the aerospace sector with my love of space and aerospace. I am a child of the Apollo program grew up in the community in Southern California that actually built the command module. So that was a big part of, of my life growing up. Uh, I went to school with a lot of students who did that as their presentations uh, for class. Then later on in the Marine Corps, I served primarily uh, with the Marine Corps aviation. And so I had a great orientation towards aviation and aerospace there as a public affairs officer. And then finally, I guess if you do this in threes, uh, once I left the military, I actually was a public information officer, public affairs officer in supporting the Navy space program, which consisted uh, of satellites mostly, not the astronaut side, but it was the uh, satellite program, both the large ones that are up there now and the nanosats that are coming online now. So you and I are probably in about that same age range then, because I was also the kid who got the opportunity to sit up at 10 years old and watch that first Apollo moon landing in 1969. And it, it, that really was one of those things that sparked a lot of people's interest in space in our generation. But it's it's kind of a different thing now. And I'm sure that's one of the issues that you work through. It is. It is. Uh, different motivations now. Uh, we have a, a whole new cast of folks that are pushing the space industry forward. We kind of went through a little bit of a downturn there uh, post-shuttle program and the shuttle program itself, which kind of had challenges finding its footing on what it wanted to be when it grew up. Uh, kind of a PR problem, as it were. And uh, so, it, but it's so exciting now to see the new entrepreneurial uh, push out there, uh, the money that's uh, interested in investing in it, and uh, looking forward to a lot of great things. I, I, I like you, I, I think my only wish is I wish I was younger, not so much to have life lessons again, but I'd love to do some of the things that these young people are going to get to do down the road. Well, if if William Shatner can fly on Blue Origin at 90 uh, uh, years old, there's hope for that's us. Good point. <laughs> that's a good point. Whenever I've mentioned going to Mars uh, to live on Mars, my wife uh, has a big smile and gladly says, please go. Just make sure to check <laughs> the house. Right if you get work. Exactly. <laughs> you, you, you kind of touched on this, but the space industry has really traditionally been government oriented and defense related. But now there's a big major commercial component. So what sorts of challenges do traditional aerospace companies, the Boeings and the Lockheeds, face in their communications, branding, and overall PR in this changing environment? Well, I think because of their prior history, they have no real public face. Um, there was a, a study conducted uh, some years ago by, and I believe it was MRSAT, but I have to check that out. But basically, the statistics said that one in five people care about the space program, and that's a significant public relations problem. And and so moving forward, it, the space industry, the uh, if you want to call it the traditional space industry, was very focused on the defense and government sector. 
So you had major players and you had a very narrow window of business. Now, the challenge is that, that these same companies need to exist and want to exist in a commercial world. And it's not just, what can I sell to these folks in the launch business to get out there? It's how can I have some kind of value add that I can bring back to consumers on this planet? Um, all of these are communications and public relations problems. Another interesting one that will develop as the brands get known out there and space becomes more prescient out there is you will probably see people starting to complain a lot more. Uh, we even get bits and pieces of news items now where uh, uh, an organization doesn't care for the environmental impact of a project or you've got somebody um, complaining about, um, oh, oh uh, a perfect example is uh, the old traditional one, which didn't come as much surface, it doesn't get surface as it does now, of, well, why are we spending all this money off planet when we should be spending it on the planet and perhaps not understanding the very big environmental impact we currently have in the space program in monitoring environment. But these folks will come back and say, no, it's an environmental issue because it's a large carbon footprint. Those are the kinds of issues uh, communications professionals deal with, whether it's getting a brand name out there to develop new business or dealing with a current complaint issue, some kind of a challenge that involves a poor communication. How big of a shadow does NASA cast over the space industry in general, kind of in the public relations realm? And I only ask because I went down and I was there for the first Artemis launch attempt. Um, and I chose not to go back for the second one because that one scrubbed as well. And there was a lot, there were memes on, on social media about, oh, they should let Elon Musk do it because he can launch a rocket and NASA's obviously having a problem. Um, does Does NASA kind of cast a shadow over the space industry in general, or are these up and coming companies doing a better job with their PR? Well, um, NASA, I guess the challenge NASA has is NASA, much like the commercial businesses we're talking about, is coming out of a, of a, of a shadow that was very government centric. And so it was, it was dealing with an information pass out only if you can a one-way communication one way now in this environment especially with social media the way it is public relations has to reorient to a conversation now i know an awful lot of people in the nasa communications uh, business and they work really hard to try and get this two-way conversation going public relations as you and i would understand it in the current commercial world the challenge is they still have some of the guidance of the old guard, which says that several people have to approve something before it goes out. So the timeliness becomes an issue. Um, they're a little bit, they're sort of, well, they are, they're not sort of, they're very risk averse because that's the nature of the business they created. They're not Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Musk is uh, talking to my compatriots down there at SpaceX and uh, is is not that particularly risk averse at all. He knows he's going to have uh, issues come up, uh, doesn't particularly care. Uh, NASA cares because they came under the old model. And, and so they're like a government agency in that respect, very conservative, very risk averse, uh, which means a lot of people signing off on communications and 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 uh, which means your reaction time is slow too. If you do have a major issue, uh, a rocket goes down where it's not supposed to. Kind of a problem. And that's too about about SpaceX is that Elon Musk, I guess, has enough money that he can follow this this mantra of I'll send one up, it'll blow up. I'll figure out what went wrong. I'll fix it. I'll send up another one, and maybe that one will blow up too. But He's then kind of gotten out ahead of that PR curve. He's established the, um, the the expectation that some rockets are going to blow up. Exactly, and and I do think in the new space industry, uh, and I I'm not sure if you're comfortable with me using that term, but I I uh, use new space to kind of encapture all this in the new space industry, the new space ecosystem. I think that attitude is going to be a lot more of what we see, mainly because we have a lot more moving parts. You can control a message and a narrative and force feed it if you're just one major entity. Now, the shadow NASA covers, it does cover some shadow because it is still a source of funding and contracts and safety releases and a whole plethora of other issues. So it does have some control, but really these corporations are, are going to be able to be do about as much as they want to. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to it, but the challenge now is for them to find the places they want to talk. Uh, because 
uh, the, uh, these companies, for the most part, are, are, and are um, entrepreneurs that were primarily engineers, and so they don't talk a lot about the work they do. They talk in generalities, I'm developing a new fuel, or I've got something good in the solid propellant fuel business, but they're not going to go into a lot of detail. And so it becomes a challenge for public relations, communications people like me too, to see what we can talk about that's not proprietary. So how do you get them to understand the importance of, of marketing, branding, and communications to the relevant audiences? Because they are, I mean, they're rocket scientists for the most part. They're they're not thinking about, it's sort of like, if I build it, they will come. That's not necessarily the case. No, sir. And and I, uh, our company is, has got some focus. Uh, we, we orient our work with our clients based on a couple of things. One is we are very stakeholder relationship oriented. Uh, so as opposed to just saying, let's send out a press release, we tend to understand the various stakeholder organizations, groups, individuals that are important to the clients that we have. With that being said, another uh, thing that we try to do with these stakeholders and understanding these target audiences is to figure out the best way to talk to them. So we, to your original question, education, much like this podcast, uh, telling the importance of various things impacting the new space business, like business practices, law, insurance, public relations, communications, um, those kinds of things are kind of new to this industry. Stakeholder relations being important, we also focus on the ecosystem holistically. So we've done quite a bit of detailed work in identifying what this major ecosystem looks like and the interaction between various stakeholder groups. Uh, so it's not a big surprise. I guess the point is it's not a big surprise if all of a sudden Elon Musk wants to launch something and we have some organization that perhaps they're concerned about a particular wildlife down in Brownsville, mm -hmm. um, and they're going to start raising some issues. We're not caught off guard with it. I don't want to make this all about SpaceX, but it, a lot of these companies that are run by the younger entrepreneurs that grew up on the internet, and it, it, SpaceX never sends out a news release. SpaceX does all of their PR on Twitter, and and that makes it challenging for somebody like me, for a journalist, to if I can't be at their launch to tell their story without having to get my information from a third source, which I don't want to do. Does do you find a lot of these entrepreneurs are kind of so married to Twitter and social media that they they kind of ignore the more traditional ways of getting a message out? Well, uh, in the beginning, yes, yes, they they come in. They are a, a younger generation, so they are uh, data natives. You know, they're they're they grew up in that world entirely for the most part, and so traditional. What we find with traditional media is, first of all, we have to draw analogies to make sure that they understand the concept is never gone, not going anywhere. TV really now is YouTube, right? Uh, uh, radio is podcasts, and print is pretty much a blog kind of a thing. So it's all digital uh, pretty much now anyway, uh, for the most part, it's digital. However, however, by working with the stakeholders, what we try to explain to them is we find all the channels that those stakeholders look at. So it might be Twitter, it might surprise them. We might find out that there's a certain part of that stakeholder organization or something that is very tuned in to receiving space news. And they read that particular magazine, the print version, cover mm -hmm. to cover. They may do digital too off their their personal device, but um, we do a lot of research to find out all the channels that they talk on. So what we try to do, getting back to your point about how best to bring them into this kind of a concept, in educating them, we, we educate them as to the um, importance of looking at multiple channels and not getting too hung up on something like Twitter, because as we saw recently, Twitter can go through some hiccups too, and all of a sudden your communication channel's done for at least two or three days. Um, that's going to continue to happen. It's in my world, because I started out life as an engineer years ago, I, it's a single point of failure. And I just don't like to have single points of failure, uh, so even in communications. My guest is Michael Daly, CEO and co-founder of Communications Metrics. Take a moment right now to click subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of our podcasts or if you're watching on YouTube, any of the videos from Xterra, the Journal of Space Commerce. Let's talk about metrics for just a minute, Michael, because uh, you're 
it's in the, the name of your company. What does metrics mean to you and how does it apply to public relations in, in new space? Well, the metrics, first of all, I always define as, as, as what is measurable to the original business objective, the business vision, the business strategy. Communications isn't a standalone function, it supports. And so if you're gonna do communications, you've gotta be tuned into part of the business planning process. What aspect of it is communications going to support or improve? What issues are gonna address? What opportunities are gonna help enhance? And so with that being said, communications metrics, a big part, and you and I both know, we work in, we're, we're working in an industry that is very, very measurement oriented. So uh, they find it very comfortable, as a matter of fact, that we have this orientation. Uh, public relations can essentially measure three areas. It measures outputs, which is the stuff that a person like me throws out there to see if it sticks, like press releases. Outtakes, which are those things that you send something out to a community, to an audience, did they receive it the way you intended them to? And then outcomes, which is the most important part of this discussion. Outcomes is, does the communication do what you intended it to do? And this doesn't all happen after a campaign plan is initiated and we start doing stuff. The evaluation process happens during the entire process so we can adjust. I mean, we're no different in our look at this than a, a process engineer would be in, in putting a, a launch vehicle together. In fact, my, my partner is a project manager. So we kind of kind of bring those skill sets into the corporation too. And so measurement, evaluation, effectiveness and efficiency is extremely important to us. And, and, and it's important to us that these metrics, uh, just to reiterate, tie to the communication item they're supposed to measure, and more importantly, tied back to the business um, objective that they're supposed to measure. Are we getting where we need to go? And, and most importantly, what is success? I mean, you'd be off, you'd be very surprised um, and, and how hard it is for a business leader to answer that question to somebody like me. And but we start with that question. We start, what is success to you? And then we start working out from there. How do you identify the various audiences? Because this is this is not a you're not trying to sell toothpaste to the general public. Right. You've got very specific, usually high-tech, very complicated things that you're trying trying to reach an audience for. How do you identify that audience? Well, first and foremost, we categorize the audience. And, and while it, I don't want this to be taken wrong, we do uh, profile our audience uh, in, in a way that tells us what is of interest to each particular audience that we deal with. Now, when I use the word stakeholder, the actual definition of stakeholder is any organization or entity that can affect you or be affected by you. And so it's it's fairly broad. A lot of people narrow that scope down. If you were to talk to business entrepreneurs right now in the space industry, they'd be very focused on their consumers, the consumers they've never had before. By the way, uh, that's their challenge. Is they used they they had one business they had to deal with. We had to give something correctly to Boeing, which was going to give something correctly to NASA. Kind of an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, now they have multiple customers with multiple tastes and are looking for perhaps multiple uses of the, what they're developing. I mean, um, so what that consumer is interested in, they have other stakeholders who have different interests. They may, they have, may, stakeholders, may have stakeholders out there that absolutely hate what they do, and they're going to do everything they can on social media and any way else they can to derail that effort. So we identify them by first answer your question specifically. And first, we put the leadership team together, the communication planning team, and the business team. We have a certain people we want in that room. And we literally go to a board and we say, let's list everybody that's important to you. And we start from that. And then from there, we bring that information out. In our particular case, we use uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence enhanced kinds of uh, research to look at anybody that's ever talked about a particular business or that industry, because we've segmented the ecosystem to about 17 sections. And then we will look at it. So anybody that's had a cross word about this company in any way we try to find. And then we'll look at our ecosystem model itself and we will try to say who should be impacting these folks that isn't or who are they not tuning into and they're watching out there in left field. Put all that together, come back and then we say, this is who we've identified based on what you've told us initially as important. 
and we start educating, getting back to the education point again, and getting them in, in this whole stakeholder relationship mindset, stakeholder engagement mindset uh, for other reasons too. We're going to bring them on board to do communicating for us. When you talk about your typical client, are you working largely with companies that sell space as service, or are you working with companies that are selling particular hardware bits to, as, a, as a subcontractor or a satellite bus or a, a launch service provider? Kind of what, what kind of clients do you generally see? Well, we, we've actually had quite, quite a, a, a cross-section. We've, we've, just to give you a cross-section of the space and service companies, we've had um, DOD, we've had Space Force, uh, where we worked uh, on uh, some issues associated with their spaceports. Uh, we have worked alongside um, co corporations like Aerospace, where we've been involved in the Space Safety Institute, which is of particular interest to us also. And then we've worked with, um, oh gosh, unique companies, uh, the space tourism. Uh, that's been mm -hmm. a fascinating one. So it's kind of a cross section. We, we, uh, we've also had chances to to touch base with folks that were in the resale business of selling uh, what you and I would call a space used stuff. I mean, we can laugh and like all space junk, but but the point is, is I know it's got very real value. It's uh, to to different people, whether it's collectors or whoever. And all of these folks still are essentially business people. Uh, the only big difference now is that they um, are having to expand their marketing scope uh, is the only way I can describe it. They've got to think beyond, I'm going to create a space suit for NASA. I now have to create space suits for tourists. I have mm. to create space suits for people constructing structures in orbit. Uh, I have to construct spaces for miners, uh, uh, resource mining. Um, and so, and then the, the other funny note on this is we have had other cl other clients that, that find their way to us. I think it's because of our process. They, they love the discipline. I, I don't know if they envision us having some kind of a military approach to this, but, but they love the discipline. They love the deliverables uh, that you co covered earlier, the, the no king, we are going to see what success is and we're going to get there through hook or crook. And um, but we've had uh, insurance companies, we've had restaurants along the way. We've even have a eucalyptus farm. Um, <laughs> these these are not the focus of our business. We we don't turn business away. I mean, at our heart, we're hardcore capitalists. But but um, but it is it does make it interesting. And I will tell you another funny note. As you've seen in marketing lately, a lot of people are hooking their their marketing now to a space theme of some kind. Mm. Uh, uh, they're they're finding ways to market it. It's interesting. It's not where new space is going to make its money. It's 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 what the music business would probably call mailbox money, uh, by the standards of the 1.4 trillion we're we're looking at down the road. But hopefully, uh, but I will tell you though that that by getting into this mode of the stakeholders and getting them oriented this way, their business practice is is much much better. Um, we take the we take the what we learn with the space business and we bring it into the consumer business and consumers love it because they feel like they're high teching. I mean, they they it's not that different, honestly, in public relations from one industry to the next. In all candor, uh, integrated marketing uh, in, uh, with public relations, strategic communications, it's the same basic theory and it's the same tools, tactics, and processes for the most part. What's different? The lingo. Uh, for one, translating lingo into something multiple stakeholders can understand, and also uh, the engineering lingo. And the other thing is, is, is the idea of taking what appear to an outsider as very complicated concepts and simplifying them so they're accepted a lot easier. Um, it's very easy to pick on a individual launching rockets into space. You remember the news from a year or so ago when the billionaire boys were getting picked on because they were sure. launching rockets and people were asking, well, why is that? So it's incumbent on us to go back to those one in five people we talked about earlier and move them to two to five, two and five, three and five, four and five down the road uh, by saying, no, 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 no. You don't understand down the road where this is going to benefit you. We don't do as good a job of that as we need to. Uh, and that's a big role of PR I'm hoping will help the industry on along the way. 
it's almost to me like you'd say, wouldn't you want, wouldn't you rather somebody was spending their own money to do this as opposed to the government spending your money to do this? Exactly. No, that's exactly right. And 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 I think the the see that's another issue, and this goes back again to what what's important about public relations to this industry. Um, this industry is very young in their concept development of narratives. You know, what is their thirty second talk about how important they are to the world. Why, why are they so important? They're very, very new to the concept of messaging, which you and I have both been exposed to over the years and the importance of creating them and staying on them, uh, even if they're older a little bit, and making sure everybody in the organization understands that, as, as well as every stakeholder. Well, I mean, that's part of our process, where every stakeholder is in some way a part of the communication planning process to, to make it more successful. Yeah, and you've got to have that elevator speech. Yes, sir, you do, you do. And, <laughs> and again, that's one of those the checks in the blocks that we do when we work with the space companies. If they have it, great, we'll look and see if we can suggest any changes that might make it a more palatable or more, more uh, expansive uh, to other audiences. Uh, see, right now, again, they're still developing their concept of the importance of other audiences. It's just, that's a very new thing to them, but they do know they need to sell products beyond one sole source. And, uh, and and it's exciting. Uh, take um, I'll take the structures development we're working on now for the moon uh, and for Mars. Uh, so we're going to go like the artificial structures um, and not building from the material on that planet or that body. Um, those, in, those structures are very important because guess what? If you can put a structure on Mars, it's my guess you could probably put one in the middle of the Gobi Desert. So, mm -hmm. so the thing is, is that by getting these companies more and more in the concept of, yes, you're building it for space, but we are going to find uses that are important here on the planet um, and perhaps down the road, then we will have the other things we give to the planet, which from my perspective will be the, uh, my one person perspective of uh, energy um, harvesting up in the, up there and bringing it down and, and uh, resource harvesting and bringing it back. Uh, but like I said, we're, um, we're right now, we're still, the, the industry is so new and so full of engineers, they're still learning a lot of these basics based on my experience. Do a lot of these companies or enough of them have someone who is dedicated to doing marketing and PR, or is it just somebody says, oh, go put out a news release and they have no idea how to send it, where to send it, how to write it, um, what what points to make? Is there Are there professionals, are there public relations professionals in these companies? Uh, yes, yeah, but but again, uh, as you might uh, imagine, it's completely dependent on the size of the company um, mm. because they have there's a internal budget involved with a decision like that. And so, for the more mature companies, yes. Now that's to, that's not uh, and it is so like Elon Musk had said, I'm going to get rid of all my communications people. I <laughs> that's not exactly the case. I mean, people were put in other parts of the company and still support. They're just no, uh, they're just not a body, as you and I might understand it, uh, within an organization that someone would easily find. Um, but that aside, most of the companies operate in a traditional sense, much like they do on the outside of outside of the space industry. The larger the company, the more they tend to have one, two, three, perhaps people that are full-time communicators. Those companies also do utilize companies like ours. Uh, for special projects or special capabilities. Um, then there's a medium-sized group of folks that hire us directly. Then there's the just starting outs who perhaps don't have a budget for communications per se, but they will do one-off things. They will contact companies like ours and they'll say, we would like to uh, tell America that our habitats for Mars are going to work in the desert, so build that ranch in Nevada. Uh, they... Uh, uh, and those are very interesting to us too. It uh, it is about uh, that, and a lot of it is budget guided because, contrary to popular belief, marketing costs money. Uh, and um, although uh, Bill Gates, uh, one of the quotes I love most about Bill Gates, in fact, we've included it occasionally on on talking pieces we've had, is if I was down to my last dollar, I would spend it on marketing. And and so an interesting quote. And mm. kind of captures the theme, at least, that you've got to let people know you're out there, um, even in a downturn economy, which is 
a topic for another day, I'm sure. But 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 there is a whole list of reasons why you would not want to cut back on uh, marketing, public relations, or strategic communication. You want to be smarter about it. But a whole, uh, there's just, like I said, arm's length of reasons not to do it, but a lot of people need to understand that. There's a classic story about the GMs and Fords of the world who did not cut back their marketing budgets during the Great Depression for just that reason. Yes, sir. And and by the same token, I've got a laundry list of people from the Depression on up. Microsoft is a current example, Airbnb, uh, Uber, most recently. Companies that started in a financial downturn and uh, did quite well. So you just, there are certain protocols. You can't be scared. You've got to, you've just got to be, you know, work uh, smarter, not harder on things. And you probably got to work harder too. But but the point is, is that you've got to be very smart about what you do. <clears throat> I want to go back just real quickly to the, the whole concept of the elevator speech. Do you work with CEOs who will go to trade shows, go to conferences, go to places? W- will you work with them to refine that message and tell them how important it is for them to know how to network properly, to get their message out in a face-to-face way as opposed to just being online? Yes, yes, we do. Um, if they, um, it depends on their experience level, but we will take it from the ground up and give them uh, media training. Um, and then this is not, a, it's not like a college course, but we have a media training we'll put them through. If we can film them, we have a complete studio in our particular organization, so we will, bring them into the studio and make them look really good and and perhaps have the proper inset stuff to talk about whatever they need to talk about services products or their company in general and um we will work with them and do like like you and i've experienced before we'll do takes with them until we get it right if we have that kind of control if they're going to talk in front of professional media we do um for lack of a better description a murder board we will put them up on a podium we will walk them through and we will then play it back for them. And, and we will talk, and it's not to pick on them, we do preface all of this is why this is important. And so they're always willing, and, and quite candidly, as we get them into the zone, once they get with those journalists, they have a good experience. Um, very seldom, I, now this is me alone talking, but very seldom do I experience the ambush journalism, and by that I mean journalism just popping out of the bushes to put something in their face and scare them to death, um, kind of an environment like perhaps I experienced 30 years ago. But with that being said, we prepare them for the unanticipated questions. We prepare them to, well, actually, we introduce them. We, we go out of our way to, to uh, create a bond between our journalists and our CEOs to, and, and our, any C-suite leadership uh, that is willing to do that. Because uh, look, this is not the Mike Daly show. Um, this is making those people famous and making those people comfortable with the media. But we explain to them in very simple terms, the media doesn't bite. They're, they're, they've got a job to do. For the most part, the media we deal with are very much fanboys and fangirls of, of the space industry. So, um, and if there is an issue that comes up, because they do come up and they will come up and they're going to grow in number, um, we just say, look, you stick, to, you stick to the messages we've developed, put your own personality in them, you stick to the narrative. You know, if your cause is just, you don't have to back away from it. And if we can anticipate what the issue is, like it's environmental would be one that comes to mind, we will have a counter point to that. We'll say, well, maybe it has this kind of a carbon footprint, but by the same token, have you considered these other worse situations? And by the way, we're working to give the entire globe free energy. So, so I mean, let, let's ex- look at the investment here, folks. Now, again, that's just an argument that might might be utilized. It's not the right argument necessarily, but it's. But I'm just saying that we teach you to do that. I will always say guilty as charged in the journalist as fanboy category. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and, and it's so much fun. It's actually a lot of fun to be out with with the media. I, I you know what, I, the question I would always prepare them for. And, and I think this is a question we as an industry, and I count myself part of the space industry, um, we have to manage expectations is the big thing because you can see some hype out there and you can start talking and get very excited. And then when the, when the rubber meets the road on where we are in a particular development of a program, 
we're going to have to figure a way to be honest with folks about these numbers and say, hey, it's exciting to talk about solar energy being beamed back to the planet, but you might be looking at, and, and I'm just pulling this out, I have them from the, a couple of books that I've read, but I, I think we're looking at 10 years here. I, I And again, that, I'm a PR guy, so don't take me on my word on that. But the point is, <laughs> we have to learn as an industry to manage expectations, one, two, always look for opportunities to, for value add. We've got to continuously pound them with value add because the space program before was very magical and very, very uh, one dimensional from the standpoint of it, it was about global strategy. And while we had science going on, that is not what got the motivation of the US government about the space program. And so, I, I mean, begr begrudgingly, they funded NASA because the Soviet Union pushed that envelope. Right. Uh, Believe me, I, I don't know where we'd have been if we didn't have, uh, not that that was a, a great reason to go forward, but I'm just saying, I'm not sure where we'd have been, because heavens, we were supposed to be um, doing agriculture on Mars by now, according to some of the sci-fi folks. So, well, there, there was 2001, a space odyssey, where we were exactly. supposed to be going exactly. to Jupiter, exactly. and I that, that didn't to, happen I either. Know. I know, yeah. and I'd still like to just live live in the, the space wheel personally. Oh I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go in a heartbeat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hopefully, for a guy of my seasoned age, you know, I might see something. But I, I don't know. I think now it's just my like I was talking to um, workforce of the future one day, uh, Tim Crispin over there, and 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 what what was interesting is talking to him, saying my role now I really envision as a motivator, and 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 let's get those young people that are going to do it. My great nephew who's a precocious four or five, and you've got a granddaughter now, those will be the young people that go to Mars and mm -hmm. stay there. And, and, and so I, I think my role is to work with folks like you to get the word out, work with folks like Tim to find the workforce of the future and develop those skill sets that we're going to need. And, and that's, that's the contribution now. I can bring the passion, but, but I'm not going anywhere. And I, I with apologies to William Shatner, I, <laughs> I love him. And, 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 and the senators in the past, you remember from the old programs, we've had senators and. Oh, sure. Well, Bill Nelson, who's now the NASA administrator. Exactly. And, and you know what? When I was a public affairs officer, I worked with a then experimental aircraft, the vertical takeoff Harrier jump jet. Mm -hmm. And it was brand new. And, and at the time, I, I had the capacity to put anybody I wanted in the backseat of the trainer of that. And you can I put everybody I could put in there. I put in congressmen, I put in judges, anybody that was influencers, I put in that jump jet because guess what? They immediately become advocates. I mean, Absolutely. It's thing or their aircraft because it happens to be their people. That's another thing with public relations too. A lot of them folks don't understand. We're talking about issues. The idea that public relations is, is local too. And, and there's a lot of reasons that you would want your young company, whether it's employment, that you bring to the community or whatever impact it is, charities you support, they've got to understand there's leadership and influencers at every level you can think of that are gonna impact their company in some way. There's a reason the Blue Angels do the media rides, which I yes, still sir. haven't gotten one yet. <laughs> yes, sir. And, and, and I, I, I don't know anybody anymore to, to promise that. I, uh, even the admirals I knew are starting to uh, have retired now. But, but the thing is, is that I hope you do. I really hope someday we can put you in the back of it that uh, what hopefully at some point will be the F-35. It's, the, mm. it's still the F-18 right now, but uh, I hope so. That'd be, that'd be something I'd like to hear your podcast on. I'd love to go. Mike, we're just about out of time, but we ask all of our guests this question to look out over the next 10 to 15 years in space commerce and tell us what you see. Well, um, from a space commerce standpoint, I, as I indicated earlier, I think the focus, while tourism is going to get the name out about space and make it, quote unquote, less dangerous, infrastructure is going to be the focus. And, and uh, um, I'm hoping energy from space uh, uh, takes on some fast legs, but but the infrastructure in order to go to the next step, which obviously is our, our lunar experience, and also to see what we can do with bringing resources back from the, the asteroid belt. Um, that 10 to, 10 to 15 years on, on that will be the, the focus. Um, the immediate five years is still gonna be, I think, heavily focused on satellites. Now. That's just a PR guy's take. From a public relations standpoint, 10 to 15 years, what I would caution folks that are listening to this on is understand that you're going to have to understand new ways of communicating. Um, artificial intelligence, uh, 
assisted reality, virtual reality uh, will be very, very important in communicating. The metaverse, you've heard rumors about it. It's going to take a very preeminent place in communications down the road. Uh, we're, we're, I know, and at least in our world, uh, my office, I know we're prepping for these eventualities right now. But you're, but you're going to see that, and you're going to have to not be afraid of it when somebody like me starts talking to you about something like this at a conference, because it, it is a reality there. So hopefully that answers that question. I mean, it's not great, great prognostication, but hopefully it'll help. It, the, the, it, well, all I asked was for your opinion, and you gave it to me, and that's that was that was the point. <laughs> Mike, thanks so much. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately, but it's been great talking with you. I've enjoyed this, Tom. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Michael Daly is co-founder and CEO of Communications Metrics. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Xterra podcast. You can subscribe to the audio version of the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other popular podcasting platforms. Be sure to click on subscribe so you don't miss any episode of the podcast or any of our other videos. You can also get daily space commerce news at XterraJSC.com. And one thing more, be sure to connect with us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter at XterraJSC. Until next time, I'm Tom Patton. Thanks for joining us. I want to go faster, faster. And in the air, we're going to crash. Such a buggy answers. My Galileo, the through is looking glass. That's the reason. Our dreamers' eyes we gaze into a sense of purpose, know my view. Like finding water on the moon.